This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? All right, on this episode of the show, we have the second part of the interview with David Polivis talking about his new book, Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. And uh, in this part, we get into a lot of the stranger cases that are going on. And uh, yeah, it gets it gets really, really weird, as if it's not already weird enough. So uh, without any further ado, here's part two of my talk with David Politis. All right, David. Um, so continuing with uh, some of the stuff in your new book, Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. And when did this get published? Uh, it came out about a week ago. And uh, one thing I would tell people is please don't go to Amazon. We're not selling it on Amazon. Somebody said today that they want 200 bucks for it on Amazon. Oh, wow. We sell it through our website, canammissing.com. C-A-N as in Nora, A-M as in Mary, canammissing.com. So essentially canadianamericanmissing.com. Perfect. And uh, it's only 25 bucks on your site. That's it. Okay, and yeah, it, it seems like people are just uh, ripping people off on Amazon. Not that it's the first time. Yeah, I know. But uh, the, the price is, I mean, obviously you're in demand. Yeah, that's always a good thing, right? If people can just get the, the information out there that Amazon's not the place to buy it. That's for sure. Now, you don't have these out as eBooks. No, you know, there's eight different forms of eBooks, and we just didn't want to go there. And it's hard enough just to get the books out. Oh, I'm sure. And These are not short books. No, there's there's a lot in there, and you know it's it, it's tough to put all of the information into a format that's an easy read that doesn't get too bong, bungled down, and yet still holds your interest, uh, but still tells a story that's convincing enough for you to understand how how complex this is. Yeah. Yeah, because if, if the problem with dry facts, which is essentially what you're reporting, you're just going in here and giving people the facts and showing them the the points where they line up. Yes. And uh, I think you do a great job of making it very readable and very and, and entertaining to read, as well as giving you the information you need. Well, I appreciate that, Soraya. Thanks. I mean, as as dark of a subject as it is, you know... It's uh, it's an intriguing mystery. Well, it's held my interest for all these years, and uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could say that we've made some huge progress in trying to understand it, but I will say that, like I said earlier, there's another spoke in the wheel. Yeah, well, it, it seems like, if anything else, we you can eliminate certain things you know it's not. Yeah. <laughs> you and I might be able to, but others out there saying, no, 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 it's... <laughs> Well, when we get done with these cases, we'll we'll discuss some of the things that that it just really can't be at this point, um, and some of those are fairly popular answers. But let's talk about Joshua Snell. So, 22 years old, June 12, 2005, 2 a.m., Eau Claire, Wisconsin. He drove there from uh, his house in Hastings, Minnesota. He was attending a friend's wedding on June 11th. And uh, he, he left on the 11th, went to the wedding. Later that night, early in the morning, uh, he went to a bar downtown, 324 Water Street, and he drank for a while. And then he called a friend and said, hey, I'm going to stop by at 2 a.m. She said, great, come on by. And at 5 p.m. the following night, or later that same day, but that night, he was reported as a missing person. Now, he supposedly made a cell phone call 
uh, early that morning saying he was in a brushy, brushy area, hiding and scared. And the firefighters heard about this, and they focused on the river area right away. And they hit it pretty hard, and they didn't find anything. But they did later, the following day, they found a shirt on a riverbank uh, on the Chippewa River near Owens Park. Now, if you fast forward three more days, uh, the search had eventually stopped because they didn't find anything. A couple was canoeing on that same river, and they found his body. And what's interesting about this is that nothing was ever released on the cause of his death or his blood alcohol level. But I go back to that Colin Finnerty case where he was said he was being chased through the woods by a couple of yeah. big guys. Very similar to this. Why would he be scared and why would he be hiding in a brushy area? Yeah, and that's exactly what it brought to mind is, is that case in the last book. Yeah. And you don't get a lot of people being chased in these accounts, but that that's two who then died mysteriously, and it may be that we just don't hear from them when this is happening. Yeah, those phone messages are rare, but I think some of them are pretty revealing if, if you look at the totality of the different calls. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get to some, some very odd cases here in this hour uh, that may tell us a little more about who might be chasing them, I think. Um, well, maybe a little less about who might be chasing them. Uh, so a lot of these people end up disappearing from places like bars. And I think the case of Brian Schaefer is a really good one to, to show people that uh, they're, they're really just disappearing. So if there's one story in this book that's brought more tears to my eyes, it's this one. And I, I don't, know, don't know exactly why other than I have so much compassion for the dad on this one. And Brian Schaefer, 27 years old, again, stellar individual, brilliant man. Uh, April 1st, 2006, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I've written before about the physicians that have vanished under unusual circumstances. Well, in this instance, the Schaefer family was devastated in a 29-month period around this date. And on March 6th, Brian was a brilliant second-year medical student at Ohio State. He had great grades. Everything in his life was perfect. He had a long-time girlfriend. He was described as loved by friends, everybody's buddy. Well, Brian had his dad named Randall and a mom named Renee and a brother named Derek, and they were all a really tight group. Well, in March, in March 2006, Renee died of cancer. And the brother, the dad, and Brian just kind of rallied together as a real tight group. Well, when Renee died, this left Randall at home alone in Fairfield County, Ohio, while Brian was going to school. Well, on March 31st, 2006, Brian Schaefer and Randall met for dinner at a place called the Eastside Steakhouse in Columbus, Ohio. And after dinner, hugged his dad, said, okay, we'll be in touch. And Brian set off to meet a friend at the Ugly Tuna Saloon in town. Pretty famous place. And Brian was leaving the next day with his girlfriend from Miami. At 10 p.m. that night, Brian calls his girlfriend at her parents' house in Columbus, and they finalize plans to meet the next day. Well, Brian was with a friend at the bar at the Ugly Tuna, and at some point, the friend says they got separated, and he couldn't find Brian. He called him many times, and he couldn't get him on the phone. And the following day, Brian doesn't meet his girlfriend, and he's reported as a missing person. Now, this guy was a second-year medical student, great grades, brilliant, didn't mess around, didn't fool with drugs, and he, he vanished. The case goes to a guy named Detective Brian Edwards from Columbus Police Department. And I, I read a lot about shoddy police work. Not this guy. He did a good job. He did a great job. He took the case, and he pulled all of the CCTV footage from the Ugly Tuna Saloon. And there's an escalator that leads up to the saloon, and that's the only way in and out. 
and there's CCTV on the back door. There's, it's completely covered. Edward spends dozens and dozens and dozens of hours watching this video inside out and backwards. Brian is, or I'm sorry, Brian, yeah, is seen at the top of the stairs talking to some women late at night. And he's seen on CCTV footage turning around, going back in the bar. And Brian Edwards, the detective, said he watched the footage nonstop for hours, and he guaranteed that Brian Schaefer never was seen on video footage leaving the bar. And there was no other way to get out. And he is completely stumped what happened to him. Now, Randall, the dad, worked tirelessly trying to find his son. He went to work for Crime Stoppers, and he tried to help other families. He was an excellent saxophone player, and he played at church. So you've got to understand, one month he loses his wife, the next month he loses his son. 25 months later, after Brian vanishes, September 14, 2008, a huge windstorm goes through Ohio, and Randall is walking through the yard that they're in, and a tree falls over and kills him. Unbelievable. Now, Detective Edwards has Brian Schaefer's image just imprinted on his mind forever. A couple of years after Brian disappears, Detective Edwards is working in an Ohio State football game and sees a face in the crowd 50 yards away, and he goes, I, I was on it. I had to follow it. And he followed it, stops the guy. It's Derek Schaefer, Brian's brother. That's, yeah. that's how on key this detective was on facial recognition. Now, Brian Schaefer's never been found. He is gone. The reason I put that in the, this case in the book is that it's one of those cases where the two friends are separated in the bar. They have video evidence that Brian Schaefer was at the bar, but he's never seen leaving the bar. And there are multiple cases in the books where that exact scenario plays out, but there isn't this constant video surveillance of the bar to prove that he never did come out. The uh, the fact that I mean, for someone to be able to remove someone from a bar without anyone noticing is almost unthinkable. Now, how would you do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, where I said to you off air before we we did this. I mean, I'm leaning toward two possibilities. Either we're looking at something paranormal outside what we understand as reality, or we're looking at some type of technology that goes way beyond anything we know that exists. Because we don't know of any rational way someone could just disappear just like that. And I want people to go back to what I said earlier is that Schaefer was brilliant. He was, a, he was on his way to being a physician. This isn't some drunk in an alleyway. There, there seems as though there is distinct logic of people with a specific profile being targeted. And, and a lot of the people in this book are found. That's not always the case in the wilderness. But in these cases, it almost seems like they're, they're intending them to be found more often than not. Yes, correct. And this is one of those rare instances where the guy's never found. Um... You also note in this book that a number of people have disappeared from the same hotels. You know, there's uh, the Sheraton Towers in Chicago. Uh, you think about the number of the hotels in Chicago, and two from the same hotel. I think, uh, I didn't write about that many cases in Chicago, but two from the same hotel fit in the same profile. Very strange. But, you know, I've written about a hotel in Southern California before where there's been many, many weird, weird, strange things that have happened, and probably the strangest disappearance of them all happened there. So I think that there is something, there's something to be said to understand and to have some history of behind the place that you're going to stay at. Yeah. Now, one of the things I noticed uh, in this book is a lot of these people who are disappearing are not only of, you know, high intelligence, but a lot of them are very religious as well. 
And that seems to, I, I put that in the book because it started to strike me when I was doing this that a lot are. Hmm. And I wonder what, why that is. I mean, what, why these certain sets of characteristics are, seem to be important. You mentioned uh, a lot of them are German. I mean, by no means all of them, but a, but a more than normal amount have German heritage. Uh, you mentioned that quite a number of them are uh, have uh, type one diabetes. The uh, let's see, what 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 were some of the other things you were finding in there? You know, one of the things that uh, there's a, many with dementia, there's many with autism, there's many that have some type of congenital disability and I don't know if it's just happens to be a random occurrence or what but I do put that in the books and so people can understand that it seems to show up more times than not right and it's not something you find in the majority of the population no uh, and that's the same with uh, type 1 diabetes there's a lot of type 2 diabetes but type 1 is, is much less common so to have a number of people in this book that had type 1 diabetes is actually a little bit odd. Yeah, and especially the people out there that have type 1 diabetes that are German, huh? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, okay, so some of the cases in the book, like for instance, you have one from Ithaca College here, and he drowned in a pond or appeared to drown in a pond coming, walking home from a party. In that case, I mean, it does fit the criteria of what you're looking at. But it also isn't so odd that it couldn't have just maybe happened. And there's there's a few cases here and there where it seems like maybe they really did possibly just get drunk and fall in the river because they were found fairly soon after they disappeared and there's not any obstacles to where they're found necessarily. Um, one of the things I was thinking, uh, being diabetic myself, is that diabetes can sometimes cause odd behavior. But I don't think any of the cases where anyone was diabetic were that they were seen doing anything particularly unusual. Right. Exactly. And I, I think that when you, when you think about the people that have this hereditary condition or a congenital condition, how would anybody know you have that condition? Yeah. Well, for something like that, there, there could be a scent. I do believe they train dogs to tell when when some people's blood sugar rises. I mean, it does change your, phys your you know your your system if the blood sugar gets high or low. So maybe something's picking up on it. Yeah, possible. Or maybe they've been watched for a very long time. Maybe, maybe I, I don't know. It, it's so there's so many possibilities and so many ways to go with this. It just the the patterns you're finding don't make sense to us looking at it from the direction we're looking at it. Correct. Um, have you ever found any G GHB in anyone from uh, the cases in the wilderness? So you got to understand something that this isn't on the primary toxicological screening, right? That medical examiners do. So that's number one, and number two, in the woods. Uh, I've written a lot about that the victims are found, if they're found alive, they're semi-conscious or unconscious. Yeah. And if you think about that, that fits that GHB uh, symptomology. And they just wouldn't think to check for it. No. Exactly. Huh. All right. Well, let's get to one of the weirdest cases in this book. And that's a, a Lisa, a Lisa or Eliza Lamb. I'll go with whatever you say. <laughs> and she's she may be probably the well most well known case in this book because her video went viral on the internet a year or so ago. And if people go to YouTube and put in her first name E L I S A and her last name is Lamb L A M, you'll be able to watch it. Uh, January 31st, 2013, Los Angeles is when it happened. And I first talk about the location. It's the Cecil Hotel, 640 South Main Street in L.A. Depending on where you read it, it opened in 1924 or 1927. It has 14 floors. There's four water tanks on a platform on the roof. The roof is restricted access. It's locked. You can't get up there, and it's alarmed. 
Uh, the hotel is an advertised location for business people, but most people would consider the area it's in as a skid row. Some history behind it is uh, a guy named Richard Ramirez, who was known as a night stalker, he was convicted of 13 killings between 84 and 85. He lived on the 14th floor for $14 a night, and some people called his killing satanic. In 1991, an Austrian named Jack Untweger came to the U.S. and lived at the Cecil. He supposedly was a journalist covering crime in L.A., and he lived at the hotel for five weeks and killed three prostitutes in his room. In 1964, Goldie Osgood was staying in the hotel. She was stabbed, raped, and killed there. Oh, man. In the 50s to the 60s, the Cecil got notoriety as a location with the most suicides. In 54, a woman named Helen Gurney jumped and killed herself. In 62, Julie Moore jumped and killed herself. In 62, again, a woman named Pauline Otten jumped out the window, landed on a pedestrian. Both were killed. And what I say in, in the book at this point is I say, wouldn't you like to know the history of the location <laughs> you're staying at? Yeah. Well, how about the history of the room you're staying in? Would you be comfortable staying in the room that Richard Ramirez killed 13 people in? You know, I would at least like to be aware of it. Man, you're brave, sir. I, I wouldn't want to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> because that way, if something odd happened or I started feeling weird, I might be able to connect to why. Yeah, uh, until you're flying out the window looking at concrete below. <laughs> true, true. And then that says, did these activities in this place cause this place to to get a bad vibe that caused these things, or is it the location all along? Cause and effect, who knows, right? Yeah. So Lisa Lamb, she was a psychology student from University of British Columbia, as by chance, UBC is a case I've written about two other students who disappeared under unusual circumstances. And she was on a holiday break. Her Chinese family owned a restaurant in a town called Burnaby just outside of Vancouver. She rode Amtrak to L.A. She got a room at the Cecil. Now, why she went to the Cecil, we'll never know. Uh, but while she was there, she went to San Diego Zoo. She saw Conan O'Brien's show. And we know this because of Facebook posts. Her friends stated she would never drink alcohol and would never smoke or use drugs. She called her parents daily and reported in just to keep in touch. And her parents knew something went wrong when she stopped calling. So her parents called Vancouver police to report her as a missing person, and Vancouver in turn called LAPD. And LAPD in turn went to the hotel and brought in search dogs to scour the hotel from the basement to the ceiling. And they brought dogs to the ceiling, up onto the roof, and no scent was picked up. Nothing suspicious was found. Not, no locks were tampered with. Nothing was broken. No alarms were malfunctioning. Everything worked. Now, on April 14th, LAPD released a CCTV footage of Elisa on the elevator in the hotel. She was wearing black shorts, a red sweatshirt, sandals. She enters the elevator, she presses the buttons, and backs herself into the corner. People say she looks frightened. Some say she's talking to somebody. She turns around and peeks out into the hallway. She goes in and out of that elevator a couple times. And eventually, she, the elevator won't move, even though she's pressing buttons. And she exits, and she's never seen again alive. Now, fast forward to February 19, 2013, and residents in the hotel are complaining about low water pressure. A maintenance man takes a ladder to the roof, turns off the alarm to the door, unlocks the door, and goes up onto the roof. And he's made his way up to four 1,000-gallon tanks that are sitting on this platform about four or five feet up off the top of the hotel. Each tank is about four foot in diameter and eight feet tall. There isn't a ladder to get to the top of the tank, so he had to bring a ladder to get to the top to open the latch to look inside. Now, he opens the secure latch on the tank, and inside he sees Elisa floating face up naked. Obviously, something's really wrong. 
So he calls LAPD. They respond with the robbery homicide team, and they bring in their crime scene crew. They say that the tank is too small to remove the body, so they have to cut a hole in it to get her out. They find her sandals around her in the tank. There's no visible injuries to the body. On February 20th, CBC Canada, one of the big news agencies in Canada, has a scheduled interview with LAPD detectives about the case, and they cancel the interview at the 11th hour, and they won't talk. On February 22nd, the coroner's report comes out as inconclusive cause of death. Four months later, the coroner comes out with a supplemental report stating it was accidental death by drowning. They never tested for GHB. They stated that her blood alcohol level was 0.02, but that was caused by decomposition in the body. That, that mm. tends to put your blood alcohol level a little bit up. I requested and got a 27-page coroner's report from the L.A. coroner's. I requested a copy of the LAPD report on the case. I was denied. L.A. said they wouldn't release their police report. Uh, the coroner's report listed that her clothing that was found in the tank was exactly the same that was seen in the elevator footage. They stated that it wasn't suicide and there was no foul play involved. What I write in the book is you've got to think logically here. If the death was accidental, you must believe Elisa went to the roof, somehow bypassed a locked door, somehow bypassed the roof alarm, somehow managed to walk up the side of a, or managed to get up the side of a slick tank with no ladder, managed to get inside the tank, managed to take off all of her clothes, and then she drowns. And, and not only that, but since they couldn't get the body out, how would she have gotten in? You're singing to the choir with that statement. <laughs> what, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, this one bothers me more than some of the other ones, and maybe it's just because I saw the video. Uh, but when I first looked at this case, I mean, it's it's not only puzzling, but I, I you can you can really feel for her when she's sitting in that that elevator, just kind of freaking out. And I think most people's first response is that she's on something, you know. But obviously, they did the toxicology, and her friend said she didn't do drugs, and you know, there's no easy explanation for what's happening there. And there's also no good explanation for why the the elevator isn't responding. Correct. Um, her behavior isn't just like she's hiding from somebody. It's like she's trying to figure out what's going on. Right. And then, of course, again, as you said, how did she get to the roof? How did she get inside there? I mean, why would she get inside there? Um, it's just, it's so hard to wrap your brain around. It just literally does not make sense. The facts don't add up. If Elisa had made her way to that roof, and if she had somehow crawled up that platform and crawled up the side of that tank, her scent would have been all over that platform and all over that tank. Yeah. And there was none. Why, and, and I've, in all my books I've talked about these, why would she be found in that tank naked? Yeah. And there's, because there's no reason her clothes would have come off just by being in the tank. No. And it's not a place you go for a swim. No. Now, if that wasn't unusual enough, I was reading L.A. News around this time, and this article came up, and I almost, I almost fell out of my chair. I have a friend that's in the medical <laughs> business, and they could not believe what I had just shown them. So Elisa's pulled from that water cistern on February 19, 2013. On February 21st, two days later, there's an article in the L.A. Times about the Center for Disease Control dispatching a group of scientists to L.A. to understand a, a sudden surge in this atrocious strain of spreading tuberculosis that they can't seem to control. Now, first of all, for the CDC to respond to a group of scientists anywhere it takes a major miracle, but they did. That tells you how bad it must have been. So they respond, and 
the scientists in the article stated that they would be using, now follow this, the lamb slash ELISA TB test in this incident. This is not a joke. They would be using the LAM, L-A-M, slash ELISA, E-L-I-S-S-A, TB test to confirm the presence in these victims. We go back and we did a history on this test, and it existed as long as eight years ago before this incident happened. Now, you tell me, is that the oddest set of coincidences you've ever heard? Yeah, it, it, that's another one. I mean... A coincidence, a coincidence is a coincidence, but that's just what are the chances that that's going to drop right at that same location two days after she was pulled from the tank? Well, and you have to understand that she's pulled from the tank on the 19th. They respond a team two days later, meaning that the tuberculosis had to have been running rampant for at least a couple weeks beforehand for it to get elevated to the point that they sent scientists out. True, true. So if Elisa was in town on the, or in town uh, sometime before the 31st, like the 25th, and they respond, scientists, on the 21st of February, there's your run. And how odd is it that this test is named, her name reversed? Yeah. Because how often does that happen, period, that you'll find a test like that that, that is the reversal of someone's name? And it's not like her name is a real common name. No, not at all. So, yeah. one more pretty odd one, circumstance, coincidence, is that uh, there's a website that drew a correlation between the facts of Elisa's case in a tank with a movie that was called Dark Water. Yeah, that, that's the first thing that came to mind when I read about this case, because I had seen that movie. Oh, well, tell us about it. I uh, It's... <laughs> All right. Uh, it's a ghost story. The original is uh, Japanese, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, is it, it is. Japanese? It is. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's about a, a girl who has drowned in the water tank on top of the building. And there's a lot with ghosts, and especially with hair, like hair coming out of the sinks and stuff like that, if, or if I remember right. It's been a, been a few years since I saw it. Kind of weird. But you... Yeah, it is kind of weird. Because like I said, it's the very first thing that came to mind is that movie of the, the girl in the water tank on the roof. <laughs> right. Yeah, and then uh, you kind of brought this up earlier with cattle mutilations. Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm a mile wide and an inch deep because I, I read a lot of peripheral things that probably have nothing to do with missing people, but I read them anyhow. And in Chris O'Brien's book, Stalking the Herd, I read that. And I know Chris, and he's a good writer. And he wrote about uh, some cattle in Argentina, I think it was, that disappeared. And the guy went down, and he found them all in a tub or a water tank. And he couldn't understand how they could get themselves up into this tank in any way plausible. And... I wrote that in the book because I don't want people to think that I'm trying to put myself in a corner on this, but I'm keeping an open mind trying to find similar things that have happened. Now, in George Knapp's book, uh, Skinwalker. Yeah, Hunt for the Skinwalker, yeah. Uh, this family came home and found three of their steers inside of a camper stuffed so tight that they couldn't even move, and they had to cut the camper apart to get them out. Not only that, but I think it was locked. Probably. And so there's a couple of very, very strange incidents about how certain things got into a location, didn't make sense, almost seemed implausible and impossible. And I think you could almost say that about what's happened here to Elisa. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But not only that, there are other connections to cattle mutilations as well, uh, because many of the... Uh, the bodies that, that that are mutilated seem to have been dropped from a height. So if, if you're right about them being suddenly just snatched up into the air, it would make sense. I mean, this is one of the theories of what's going on with cattle mutilations, because there's never any blood or any sign that anything's been done in the area that the cattle are found, and they seem to have just been dropped back into place. Well, 
and, and I'll, I will say something factual here, and I say it in the book, is that one of the most unusual things I found in the coroner's report, and you won't probably hear about it anywhere, is that the coroner stated that they didn't do toxicology on the blood because there wasn't enough blood in the system to get toxicology results. And that was with Elisa? Right. Yeah. And that's, again, very common with ghetto mutilations because they do seem to be drained of blood with no blood on the site, nothing uh, uh, under the body or anything. Right. So th there are connections, even though these people aren't being mutilated. Um, also, if people are taking cattle and mutilating them, whatever they're really doing with them, they don't have to bring them back. Just like these people could just disappear forever, why are they being put back for us to find? Yeah, well, why, don't, why aren't the cattle put in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere? Why are they put right back in the same location where they came from? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, it's almost like pe these, whatever is doing it wants us to find it. Right. And there are, I mean, there are some isolated cases here and there of supposed human mutilations, but I don't know if any of those have ever been, you know, like really solidly researched. Yeah, I haven't seen anything along those lines that I would, you know, put my heart and soul into. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's different in that respect. There is no mutilation going on. The bodies, in fact, almost seem too good for being dead. Right. Versus the mutilations where something has obviously done a lot of damage to the, to the body, and we can tell why the cattle died. We just don't know how. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I wish I understood what happened to uh, Lisa. Or, uh, I, I wish I could talk to a detective and understand their theory about what happened. But to say it was an accident, you must believe that she went up there and purposely went into that tank. Well, I, I wonder, too, if it's just that they're in such a situation where they realize this doesn't make any sense. What are we supposed to tell people? And that's why they don't want to give an interview. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you tried talking to any of these people? Well, first of all, I don't even know who the homicide team... The, you work in teams on homicide. I don't know which homicide team did it, but mm. I reached out to L.A. twice through their press information officers trying to get a copy of the report, and they said, nope, we're never going to release it. Huh. I was shocked just to get the coroner's report. So, so you're running into the same type of uh, blocks as you do in national parks, but from a different angle. Correct. And, and in, in this case, though, it, it's... It may be less organized than the national parks. It almost seems like the national parks just have a, a thing about not giving out this information, whereas these police offices may just not want people to realize there's something, you know, like less organized level of not wanting people to realize that they don't have the answers to these things. Right. Um, you know, it's easier if people can just believe a suicide or a drowning is easier than saying we have no idea where this person was for five days. Well, police officers are notorious for not wanting to be questioned about their judgment mm. and not wanting anyone to take a second look at what they've done. So if there's any question about what happened with something, they're better off not releasing anything than allowing somebody to take that second look. Now, you talked about a, uh, a town meeting or something where the, the parents and some of the people were really upset that the police weren't uh, looking into this more. Well, and, and this is a, a very brave reporter rep, uh, wrote an article about, uh, you know, a town, I think it was in Wisconsin, that uh, had a whole series of these disappearances. And the town was not buying into the rhetoric of the police saying, oh, you know, this is just a bunch of drunk college people stumbling into the water. Don't worry. We'll get out of it under control. Everything's fine. So the police chief goes in front of a gymnasium filled with people and he essentially got yelled out of the room. And what's amazing to me is that the reporter was willing to write that up. Because when you're a reporter in a small town, most of the news comes out of the police, and you're looking for them for statements, opinions, and conclusions, etc. And he, yeah. he essentially wrote the truth, which was, I applaud him for doing it. Yeah. But the town didn't buy into what was happening. They, they still think something unusual was going on. And that tells you something, too. People aren't stupid. They're not blind to this. 
the the facts aren't lining up. Right. So let, let's look at uh, another odd one, uh, another one of the few females in this book, uh, Caitlin Louder. September 27, 2014 at 4.30, West Valley City, Utah, the only case in this area of the United States. She was born uh, January 2nd uh, in 84 in American Fork, Utah. She was known as a giving heart and always helping others. She had a BA degree from, uh, in social work from Utah State. She had a small pug dog named Phyllis. She was considered extremely non-judgmental. had a twin brother named Colton, a sister named uh, Maddie, and a brother named Parley. On 9-26-14, she was at her apartment in West Valley City. And at 9 p.m., she calls 911 complaining of a loud party in her complex where there were weapons seen. West Valley Police responds, and what they find is a wedding reception with no issues whatsoever, nobody with a gun, no problem. She makes a second call that night, hangs up to 911. A third call, she seemed confused. She had trouble remembering her address. The next morning at 8 a.m., she makes a call to the police department, There's, and her quote was, they're stealing from my house she yells get the fuck out of my house and her roommate steps up and says Kaylin there's there's nobody here relax no no they're here they're taking stuff there's a hang up on September 27th at about noon close circuit television at the complex sees her outside walking her dog and she appears to be talking to an invisible person. Her parents claim she's talking to the dog. Now, at 4.30 that day, she leaves the apartment, her apartment in bare feet. No dog, no wallet or key is observed. But she's walking into the rain as it's falling. And that's the last time she's seen alive. Now, our friend reports her as a missing person later on. And they start to search the creeks, rivers, and streams, and housing, and everything in that area. There's a small creek that runs through the apartment complex to the Jordan River, and that was searched multiple, multiple times. It was stated by searchers that they didn't think the water in the creek had the ability to carry a body anywhere, but they searched it anyhow multiple times. On just, okay, so this was all happening around September, late September 2014. December 1st, 2014, her body is found in the West Valley city limits by workers examining a drain drainage pipe in the Jordan River. Her body is found almost entirely underwater in the middle of the river. Police say they, they are unknown why the body wasn't found originally because it had all been searched thoroughly. And again, they reiterate the creek near the apartment was too small to carry the body away. The coroner says that it's the cause of death was undetermined. Now, how common is it for a coroner to say that they don't know how someone died? Well, in these cases, is it, it's extremely common. It's almost one of those <laughs> profile points at, at this right. level. But well, over, about, overall, no, it's not very common. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I mean, it's usually not that hard to determine a cause of death. Well, bullet hole in the head, those are easy. Right, right. You know, overdose of drugs, those are easy. Heart attacks, strokes, all those things are pretty easy. So, and drowning, there's certain elements that they look for, but those aren't, drowning isn't the cause of death in these people. Huh. And this is another case with Caitlin here where she seems to be interacting with something that we can't see uh, just like Elisa in the elevator where she seems to be interacting with something possibly even talking to something that when there's nothing on the camera right um, or the guy I mentioned uh, in Steph Young's book where he says you know I didn't drive here they made they did it or whatever and well who's they what's what's going on with these people is there something there they're seeing we're not or is their brain being affected in such a way uh, that they, they're hallucinating. And I think with Caitlin, you know, she's obviously seeing things that aren't there, the, the gunshots or the, the weapons that she reported earlier. 
and uh, you know the other police reports that made absolutely no sense. You know, years ago when I was a policeman, there was a psychiatrist that worked at uh, the medical center that was the general hospital for the county. And uh, this person was, everybody admired him. He was just a genius guy. And every once in a while, we'd have to bring in somebody that was, quote unquote, psychotic and a danger to themselves and others. And we'd turn him over and I would talk to the guy every once in a while. And it's one time we each had some time. So I was sitting there talking to him and he goes, you know, Dave, because every once in a while, you just got to think, do these people are, when they say they hear something, maybe they really are hearing something that we just can't hear. Yeah. Yeah, they're tuned in possibly to something that we're not. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So now let, let's let's look at a couple of uh, cases here where the person actually survived. Very strange. Uh, first one, Stephen Kubaki. This uh, happened on February 1978 in Holland, Michigan. He's a student at Hope College in Michigan, which was n organized by the Reformed Church of America. It's 30 miles north uh, north of uh, South Haven, 30, uh, 76 miles south of Ludington and Baldwin, that cluster area that I talked about earlier. Right. On February 78, Stevens attending Hope and was uh, in a degree program for German. Coincidence. Right. And uh, on February 19th, he tells his roommates that he's going to go cross-country skiing. And he heads out, and he's going to go to Lake Michigan right near Saugatuck. And when he didn't return that day, his roommates file a missing person report, and Michigan State Police takes over the investigation. They call the Coast Guard, they send out some planes, some boats, tracking dogs, helicopters, foot patrols, and state police found his skis and his poles and his footprints uh, on the bank of a beach on the lake, leading, his footsteps led 200 yards out onto the ice of Lake Michigan and disappeared. It's in the articles, it's right there. And, and another article said that they found his backpack in the same area. And police believed that he had drowned, fallen through the ice, and he was dead. And that's the way the case ended. And that, that I think, is a reasonable uh, assumption. Well, if you see a one-way set of tracks going out, what else are you going to think? Exactly. Now, fast forward uh, 15 months to Mar uh, May 5th, 1979. Stephen says he wakes up uh, in a Saturday night, 40 miles from his father's home in South Deerfield, Mass. John Kubaki is his dad, a 53-year-old father, thought his son was dead. And John said that Stephen told him that he lost consciousness until he woke up in Pittsfield, Mass, and said he was lying in a meadow wearing clothes that weren't his. Stephen woke up 700 miles east of Lake Michigan, almost directly east, and he, went, he made his way to his parents' home. In 1983, Stephen got an MA degree from Ohio University in linguistics, and in 92, he got a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of New Mexico. I, I tracked him down, and I called his office, and he refused to return my call. I sent him an email. He, he refused to return my email. Yeah. And he, so you, you got to listen. listen he, he's a missing student. He disappeared in or around water. Uh, he says to in the article at the time that he had no memory of what happened. Time and space were lost. And this is one of those classic cases that seems to fit every part of the profile, including loss of memory. Except for the fact that he survived. Right. And it's it's really too bad that he's not willing to, to talk about it. Well, as other people who have read the book told me, he goes, either, the, either it's too painful to talk about or he's too scared to go back and figure out what happened. Or he's afraid it's going to hurt his career in some way. And, but, you, you know, in a strange way, if he came out and he went through hypnotic regression and something really strange happened... There's so many people in this world that have psychological issues behind nightmares or alleged abductions and things. I think his business would blossom. 
Well, that's true, but he may not see it that way. True. And he may really just not, you know, you may be right, he may just not want to know. Yep. Yeah. He, he, he's, he survived, he's in one piece. It would drive me insane. I, I would need to know. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to let it go. Well, it makes you wonder what other things in his life since then has happened related to this. Yeah, or maybe he does remember now. Maybe it came back to him, or maybe he did get regressed, and he has no interest in talking about it. That could be. I mean, because like I said, it would drive me crazy to to know that part of my life is just not there. Yeah, 15 months. Where were you? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he did get regressed. I mean, he's in the right field to know somebody who could regress him. Oh, for sure. So... Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't get anything. Maybe he got something and wasn't particularly happy about it. Yeah. I mean, that would definitely, you know, make him not respond to you. Well, the last one where the person lived is is probably one of the most on-key ones in the book, but his name was Cohen, yes. Cohen Fortney, January 8th, 2006, 2 a.m., 21 years old, La Crosse, Wisconsin, What's amazing to me is I wrote in my previous book about a guy named Cohen Finnerty, an NFL right. quarterback, and this guy's name is Cullen Fortney. What would be the odds? <laughs> you know, did somebody make a mistake and take the wrong guy one time? <laughs> Maybe. So January 8th, well, 2006, Cullen was a student at University of Wisconsin, and he was on a holiday break staying with his parents 17 miles east of the Minnesota border in Viroqua. Viroqua on the Mississippi River. On January 7th, he left his parents' home and drove with a friend to La Crosse, and he was staying with a friend that night. So La Crosse has 30 drinking establishments in a neat block area. Uh, there's a place called the Last Stop Bar, John's Bar at 109 Third Street, La Crosse. And the bar is a, lot, a thousand feet from the Mississippi River. Somebody, sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m., uh, his friends tried calling Colin, and he wouldn't answer, and they couldn't find him in the bar. He was lost. Now, Colin says the last thing he remembers is being in the bar dancing with a girl. The next thing he remembers is floating down the Mississippi River with ice around him. He pulls himself to shore. He lost his hat, his shoes, and $20 in cash. And he lies on the bank, and he hears traffic, and he slowly pulls himself up onto the traffic and looks down the street, and what does he see? But Gunderson Lutheran Medical Center, and he drags himself into the medical center at 7 a.m. Now, the water temperature was 32 degrees. The fact of this is he, couldn't, he could not have been in that water no more than 10 minutes. It's impossible because he wouldn't live probably only five minutes. Statistics say that if you're in the water 15 minutes, you're going to die. Now, if he would have stayed on that bank any longer than a couple minutes, hypothermia would have set in, he would have died. So at 8 a.m., La Crosse Police Department respond to the medical center, and they take his blood alcohol level, and it's 0.04%. That's like two beers. Backtracking six hours, which was the time he was gone, it would have put his blood alcohol level at 2 a.m. at 0.16. Pretty well sauced up. Mm -hmm. The distance from the bar to where he exited the river was 1.5 miles. He, they asked him repeatedly what happened, and he said, I have no memory of what happened between I was dancing at the bar and I ended up in the river. The fact is, he had to have been placed in the water at about 6.45. So that leaves four hours and 45 minutes unaccounted for. Now, what's weird about this is he was the second victim, victim that night to vanish from the same bar. The second victim woke up in the lobby of the ho uh, hospital. Both of them had no toxicological screening done for GHB. And the newspapers reported that Colin had fell in the river, which is blatantly not true, because he couldn't have. He would have been dead. And everyone says that has looked into this like I have, he had to have been held, released in the water to die. And 
I want everyone to think about the number of colleges and universities in North America, including Canada, that have a large body of water near it, a river running nearby it, and why don't these incidents, if they just happen to be drunken college kids, why don't they happen equally across the U.S. at all of these locations that have these water nearby? They yeah. don't. It's specific locations. And there, again, is this clustering effect of these disappearances, just like in the other books. Were, were you able to get a hold of Cullen? You know, I didn't even try, honestly, because Gannon and Gilbertson, they went and debriefed him, and that's where he said, hey, I don't remember anything. He made those statements to them. Okay. All right. And he never went through any kind of regression to, to see if there was anything he could remember. No. And we don't know, of course, if there was any drugs in the system. No. But, you know, I mean, if someone gets essentially roofied at a bar, you know it's not something that goes unnoticed most of the time, especially if it's a bigger guy. Well, and he's at the bar with friends. If he would have been carried yeah. out, witnesses would have seen it. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I mean. Um, and from, from what I understand, it can take someone down pretty quickly, but it's going to make a bit of a scene. Oh, for sure. Especially if he's dancing at the time. That's right. And then you still have the question of how did they dump him in the middle of the river. In all of these incidents, you got to remember... Nobody has ever seen leaving the bar, getting drug out of a bar, carried out of a bar, and nobody's ever being ever seen dumped in a river, or they've, they've never seen them um, fall in or jump in the river. And you talk about, at one point, uh, a camera that shows a guy on, a, on, a, on the edge of a river, and when it pans back, he's gone, but no one ever sees him jump in. No. There always seems to be that if there's a camera nearby, the point you need to be seen, they're never seen. It's 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 so it seems so orchestrated. Yes, I mean, that that's the best word I have. It seems orchestrated. Someone is pulling these strings to essentially be invisible in all of this. Correct. But instead of getting you know something we understand, we're getting something like Cthulhu. You know, yes. you know when we try to look at the shape here. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about some of the things it really can't be at this point. And I, I think the biggest one people were married to from the beginning was uh, Bigfoot. Now, unless there's people working with Bigfoot, I don't think Bigfoot is going into a bar and somehow kidnapping somebody. And carrying them down the street and dumping them off a bridge into a river. I, I would say right. that's pretty well certain this is not happening. And drugging them. I don't think they're getting drugged, no. <laughs> By big and the, the drugging one is kind of a, an important factor. If all these people are getting this drug, either something is really setting it off in their system, that it's producing an abnormal amount, or somebody is flat-out drugging them. I, I don't see how there's any other cause and effect. You, you have to follow the logic, and you have to follow the evidence. Um, the second one a lot of people like to, to latch on to is the idea of a serial killer. And with these clusters and their age, there's no way a single person could be doing all of this by any stretch of the imagination. No, and you look at the amount of time this has been going on, the number of countries involved, the number of loca locations involved, the, the dates don't make sense. It, there's no way a human could be 100% effective at eluding and not being seen, either dragging, carrying, or dumping the person. Right. Now, um, you could almost say, well, maybe there's some kind of organized group, but that still doesn't explain how they're getting them out of bars, how they've never been, as you said, never been caught in any way. No one's ever seen it happen. Um, so, I mean, for, an or, uh, for any kind of organized group, someone's going to slip up sooner or later. Someone's going to talk. Someone's going to slip up. But the best thing, and, and people have to remember this, is what is the motive? And yeah. how can they get away with killing people and our forensic people can't figure out how? Yeah. 
And I mean, there's there's also a lot of people speculating that it's some kind of ritual uh, murder situations. But again, how are they killing them? Correct. Are they smarter? Are they smarter than all of our scientists and medical examiners? Now, this this is why I say, if it is something like that, if it is a human agency doing this, it has to be somebody with access to much more advanced technology than what we know of. Because they're able to just snatch a person. And they're able to kill them without any sign of why they died. And they're able to put them back without any anyone ever seeing them. Um, it would take you know, a, a century beyond the technology we have now to, to do something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not impossible, but again, it, it that's just random speculation because I don't know what else could do it in a human agency. No. Now, um, the guys who wrote on the smiley face murders, they, they believed it was a group of serial killers, right? Right. Um, and, but, how were they explaining their, their, these people's disappearances? So you got to understand that they were looking at a handful of cases. Okay. And they were looking at, uh, I mean, at the end, they were looking at many more locations, but they weren't looking at this at, at the level I was able to dig. And they didn't also have the ability to look at the research for the previous five years and say, wow, there is a relationship here. They were only looking at water, and I don't think that they understood the specific profile points that I brought into it. The, and, and there are a lot of interconnections here, although they're not immediately obvious, between the National Park disappearances and these disappearances. Because um, a lot of the National Parks ones were also around water, but people weren't always found in the water. No, a lot of them were found in dry creek beds, next to rivers, next to streams, boulder fields, things like that. Yeah. And again, the boulder fields have a lot of connections with folklore. Oh, for sure. Um, what, what, what do you think... Okay, so when you're not seeing some of the, the main points from the wilderness disappearances and these disappearances, do you think it's just because the situation is different or maybe some of those points weren't... Uh, weren't really there. Well, I, I do think that you have to keep an open mind, and you, it, it's almost like a moving target because if these if these incidents all involve the same group doing it, then that plausible deniability factor they don't want anyone to recognize what's going on. And so if you keep an open mind and you can continue to draw lines between the facts, then you can continue to say, well, these might all be related. But you've got to keep that open mind and you've got to look for those specific profile points. Hmm. You know, in instead of uh, disappearing from berry fields, they're disappearing while in bars, crowded bars in some cases. Right. Um, and that that's the thing. I mean, you can understand someone disappearing picking berries because, well, they're out in the wilderness. They could have wandered off. They could have done this. They could have done that. But when you're in a bar, it seems like somebody would notice if you just disappeared. Yes, you would think so. But obviously, there's something going on that we don't understand that people... You know, go back to the Grozel case where the girl went to sleep. Yeah, yeah. So is there something happening where they can put you to sleep or they can wipe your memory and you don't see what happens? I don't know. Which is, which is a very valid point. I mean, it could, be, uh, it could be some level of mind control. And if whatever this is can affect someone's perceptions... We don't know how much of the, you know, all we have are the after effects really to go by. Anything else could be altered. Right. Um, it, it's, you've actually made this more mind-boggling with this book. <laughs> like, it was bad enough in the wilderness, wilderness stuff, but when you, when you connect these to it, it just, I don't know, it, it's so 
it, it hurts your brain to try and wrap it around it because there's just no easy answers here. I was really hoping, Sarai, that we would have this program and you would be able to solve this for me. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Because <laughs> uh, it, it, it actually, it, it's on my mind a lot. Like, you know, I'm always trying to look at it from different perspectives and, and see maybe, you know, what are we missing here that might make this make more sense? Yeah. And I'm sure you're doing the same. Oh, it drives me nuts. Yeah. It drives me nuts when you put this book together and within days after it comes out, people just start sending you cases that you know are right on target and are recent, and it's happening right now. Yeah. Um, what are you doing? Are you continuing to, to research these cases or just jet cases in general and see where it leads you? Well, how many spokes to the wheel are there? Yeah. What am I, I mean, when I first started this research, there were the people out there that said, oh, you know what's doing this. You know what's happening. Within the last month, somebody on Facebook said, you know, you're not being right to the victims and the families. You need to say right now what's doing this. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm not a magician. Yeah, don't you wish you could? Oh, yeah. And, and then other people said, oh, you're just writing these books to make money, and you could solve this overnight by just telling us what's doing this. I'm thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, if you could tell us what's doing it, it would solve it overnight. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'd probably be a hero in a lot of people's eyes if I could, but I'm not that smart right now. <laughs> I don't know if it has anything to do with not being smart enough. Like I said, it almost feels like we're only seeing part of the picture. Yep. You know, um,. What what are some of the other explanations that, that people have thrown out there that simply don't work? So I don't know if they work or they don't work, but the other one I get a lot is reptoids. Ah, yes. Um, I've never known what to think of the reptoid thing. I mean, there's clearly a connection to the whole UFO phenomena in general, but the idea of, like, the whole David Icke idea of reptoids seems a little far-fetched to me. Yeah. I mean, we never know. Anything's possible. But if I'm going to weigh down what I think is more or less likely, I'm going to lean against the, the David Icke view that there are reptilian aliens running our government. Then the other one is uh, I get a lot of is little people or fairies. Yeah, well, I, I can see it, there being a connection there. Not being literal fairies. But I, you can see in some of the folklore some of the similarities in the stories. Right. Uh, which, again, says it could be something that's been going on for a very long time. And again, I suppose if I could get a room full of experts on fairies and reptoids and aliens and we could have a roundhouse discussion, but is there really an expert out there in those fields? Well, no, because so much of it is speculation. That's the problem. Right. I mean, you can have an expert on folklore. Sure. Um, and you have tons of people who are experts on the UFO phenomena who all may hold completely different viewpoints. Right, right. <laughs> because we don't know. This is, this is the problem with any of this stuff is we don't really know. We can, we can put together theories. We can, we can even support those theories to some degree, but we don't have the absolute proof. We, don't, we can't prove Bigfoot exists. We can't prove that UFOs are extraterrestrial or extra dimensional or, or any of this stuff. I mean, it, it, it seems to exist in sort of a halfway state between subjective and objective evidence. Yeah. And this may be connected to that somehow, but we don't understand it. So we can't solve it that way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, um, are are there any theories that stand out to you that that seem like they might lead somewhere eventually? You know, the, it goes back so far in time that it shows that we've had many revs of technology development in the last eighty years. So, if they were successful, or whoever was successful eighty years ago at doing this. It doesn't seem like it could be anything related to us as people in the United States that's doing it. Hmm. And maybe it's something observing us. Yeah. 
picking these people up to, to test something, who knows what. Yeah. You, you know, I've, I've got a good headache going, so, you're, you know, you're, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, where can people pick up the new book? Uh, canammissing.com, C-A-N as in Nora, A-M as in Mary, missing.com. All right. And it's called A Sobering Coincidence. It is not available on Amazon. Well, it is available on Amazon if you want to pay $200, but don't go there because <laughs> buy, right. buy it from my site a lot less. Yes, and, and you sell it for how much? Twenty four ninety five. Okay, so keep that in mind, people, because occasionally people will complain your books cost too much, and twenty four ninety five for this length of book is about right. Well, thank you. And uh, but if you're looking at a hundred bucks for it, yeah, there's that's why they think it's costing them too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything coming up you want to talk about? No, no. Uh, I think uh, the book is you know doing well and. The feedback from people like you is really good right now, so all's well. All right. Well, thank you so much, David. Hey, thanks a million, Soraya. All right. And that concludes part two of the interview with David Politis. The new book is Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. You can go to canammissing.com to pick up a copy. Again, don't pick it up from Amazon. It is uh, You're just going to get ripped off. So canammissing.com, as in Canadian-American, missing.com.